My name is Maria. I'm 43. I've been out since uh, forever. But what sort of a lifestyle do you have? Is it markedly different from any heterosexuals? Not at all. Do you do the gay clubs? Anyway, where the music's good. <laughs> This is South Africa, where gays like these are able to enjoy a thriving social life and greater legal protection than most other countries in the world. My name is Timbaletu Victor Mangala. This is the most gay place. It's beautiful. So you can do things like what, walk down the street hand in hand with a girl. Oh, there. yeah. It's, it's the law. What else? You'd have your sort of rights in terms of property and things like that if you would stay together for a long time. You just feel like a good old citizen. I'm so happy that everybody is equal because of the constitution. It was like really, really a big change in, in gay people's lives. I felt so happy and so confident. 13 years ago, South Africa elected a new government. With the African National Congress came a new president and a radical new constitution, which became the first in the world to enshrine the rights of homosexuals. Last week in this BBC series coming out, I was in Jamaica finding out why people were so anti-gay. In the Jamaican case, what's behind a lot of this is their reading of the Bible. Chapter 19 of Genesis and Leviticus in particular carry very strong messages. This week I'm trying to find out what it's like to be gay on the African continent and my journey begins here on the elegant steps of the South African Parliament in Cape Town. My name is Professor Gard Asmel and I'm a member of Parliament here. Well, for us, equality was a central part of our struggle. We set up a constitutional committee in 1987. And in 1991, before the negotiations, I looked at the equality clause. There should be no discrimination in terms of age, language, culture, race, and sexual orientation. We had a conference on the Bill of Rights. And I chaired this section, and there were 500 people. And I said, now, let me draw attention to this clause, sexual orientation. Why do you have to attention? Let's pass it. And then, of course, the ultimate constitution, which we are very proud of, it was adopted by the Constituent Assembly in 1996. Can you lay out exactly which rights the constitution gives to gay people in detail? If you specifically talk about gays and lesbians, then you must turn to the constitutional court. First of all, a judge asked that her pension should be available to her companion. There's a policewoman, Africa, and said her partner should be able to get medical aid. Then we said, the Constitutional Court, that if someone has a companion overseas, comes here, you get permanent residence. And then, of course, adoption. Gay people could adopt. Rights of gays are the rights of everyone. Constantly, we are extending the boundaries of freedom. It's not the job of the state to say who you can make love with, except when it's exploitation. That's a very private thing. South African gays have the same rights as heterosexuals. They have political, economic and social freedom and they're protected under the law. But that's not all. My name is Buhsin Hendricks. I'm a gay imam and also a Muslim scholar. I was born and bred in Cape Town. I'd never encountered a gay imam until I came to South Africa. I'm in a very so comfortable space within South Africa because we are protected by our constitution. There have been threats on my life, but via the phone and verbally. I have been on local Muslim radio stations as well talking about the subject and so there was just verbal abuse on radio but I found that lately when I go back onto radio station there's a little bit more respect and a little bit more tolerance because one of the things that we have managed to create within our community is debate. One imagines it must have been a very tough decision to come out in a Muslim community. Tell me about that. I was married for six years with a woman. I think part of the reason why I got married was when I engage with a woman sexually, that'll change my life. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. But I'm blessed with having three beautiful kids out of that relationship. My mother was the first person I needed to come out to. In fact, she asked me, I hear that you got divorced because you are, I said, gay. So she said, are you? And I said, yes. And I thought, I'm not going to hide this anymore. And she fainted. But the next morning, my mother came into my room. And then she said, is there anything I can do to make you change? So I said, mother, is there anything I can do to help you to understand what I'm going through? And that was just the beginning of a good understanding between myself and my mother. She's met my partner. She actually came to stay with us for 10 days. When uh, she left, she said, you two fight like husband and wife. I don't see any difference between a straight relationship and your relationship. 
Can I ask you about your children's attitude? What do they say to you? They know you're gay. I have a little bit of problem with my son, but my daughters are very accepting because what they've been seeing as they were growing up is a loving father, is a father that cries with them when they get hurt. And so it's difficult for them to understand why society wants to kill their father. And today they are living with me. They prefer to live with me than their mother. Can you tell us how you explain to your children that you were gay? I explain to them that most men are attracted to women, but daddy actually loves men. Uh, it was something that they couldn't understand because when they go to a Muslim school, they would actually say, my daddy's a gay imam. And then the teacher would tell them, no, you shouldn't speak like that. And they were even telling them that your father's going to go to hell. And now that they are teenagers, they're more comfortable with, with the issue. But they're still experiencing a stigma. Unlike most countries, here in South Africa, it's a criminal offence to discriminate against gays and lesbians. Last year, the South African government went a step further in its progress towards social equality. It became the first state in Africa, and only the fifth in the world, to legalise same-sex marriages. I'm wandering about a car park. We've driven for about 40 minutes outside the main drag of Johannesburg, and uh, I'm looking up at the most starry sky. And we're just about to go inside for a very special ceremony that we've been invited to. And here we are, we're in the hub of a wedding party. What a difference. Hi, I'm Claire. Hi. Hi, Can you tell me who you are? I'm Philippe. My name is Malcolm. What a great place. It is, yes. It's stunning. Sit out in the the bush. Yes. Oh, a little waterfall. And this is a significant day for both of you. How long have you been together? 16 years altogether. Why was it so important to have a wedding? It was just a way of sharing with our family and friends who we are now that South Africa has given us the chance not only to have a civil union, but the great thing about South Africa is we can actually call it a marriage. It's the only country in the world that has the constitution that protects gay rights and has embraced gay marriages and civil unions. So it was very important for us. Does it feel exactly the same as attending someone else's wedding, a heterosexual couple? It does have a slight uh, gay element to it. We've got the rainbow flag at the back. Yeah, we're playing <laughs> ABBA. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, hello, I'm Claire from the World Service. I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm Malcolm's mother. mother. Malcolm's mother. Yes. How do you feel being at Malcolm's wedding? I'm very proud because it's with the new laws in this country that it allows for that. And would now you, would you each say other's responsibility. <laughs> Not <laughs> mine anymore. <laughs> would you say your views are particularly liberal? No, when I first found out that my son was gay, it did take some time getting used to it because I grew up in the traditional way. I had to learn. I'll be honest in front of Malcolm here now. It was a shock at first, and I'm very glad that he fell in love with someone, not that he went and stayed in the closet. I'm glad he was honest. I'm proud of them, and I hope you two will care and love each other always. And to anyone that's listening to this who harbours completely different views, maybe the way you were a long time ago, what would you say to them if they, they had real problems about the whole issue of gay marriage? Go with it and remember that your children are the same children they were before they found out that they were gay. They are born that way, accept them as they are and love them as they are, always. The legal definition of marriage here in South Africa has been changed from a union between a man and a woman to a sexually neutral phrase, union between two persons. For some living here, it's a concession too far, and I've come to Parliament to meet one such person. Well, I'm Patekilo Lomisa. I am a traditional leader and an ANC member of Parliament in Cape Town. When the constitution was adopted and there was a clause, there shall be no discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. We didn't understand it, that clause to mean that the state would be required to legalize the same-sex marriages. Is that something you could never accept? Very much so, to traditional leadership and communities. In fact, seeing that we are here alone, the majority of members of parliament are opposed to same-sex laws. What would be so wrong about a man and a man getting married, or a woman and a woman? I don't understand it. They just are not supposed to be 
simply doesn't gel. But we know, we know that these things happen. Those things are, are not normal. So once you do them, then something needs to be done about that. And I am told that in a number of instances where the remedy prescribed by a diviner has been taken, then the person becomes normal again. Are you saying this is a sickness that can be cured? It's an abnormality that can be remedied. Is it abhorrent to you? <laughs> it's outrageous, and traditional communities find it unacceptable. Well, I've just left the parliament where traditional leader and ANC MP Patakele Holomiso's own government introduced equal rights for gays. But he believes homosexuality is abhorrent. And if he had his way, then the constitution would be amended to remove the clause allowing same-sex marriages. Melanie Judge is a gay activist. She believes the law is ahead of society when it comes to gay rights. They are still deeply entrenched, bigoted and prejudiced social attitudes in South Africa. Even though we bandy around words like human rights and equality, I don't think that people have necessarily made meaning of that. What does it mean if I'm the father of a lesbian child? What does it mean, this notion of equality, uh, when I feel that this girl that I've given birth to is an absolute abomination? And so we're sitting with social attitudes that in some senses are hardening and that aren't in keeping with, with these, these principles that are entrenched in our law. I've just arrived at a lesbian and gay centre. It's a, an austere, modern two-storey building, and it's packed with women chatting. Amongst them is a small, elegant lady dressed in bright yellow clothes. She's a lesbian mother who lives in the neighbourhood. She took me to a quiet room, sat me down, and told me the following story. I think it was in 2002. I was gang raped. That was the most terrible thing that have ever happened to me. Can you tell me a little bit more about the day that happened to you and how many people were involved? Uh, Christian Church, they invited me to do a presentation. I took three taxis coming back home. Just two houses from my place, these guys just came. I knew them, they knew me. There were three of them, and then they decided to pull out the gun, and they said, I must stop. I said, no, again, and they did a warning shot. They went to the other guy's place. And then the youngest took me to his place. He raped me the whole night. And the other two men had raped you pr prior to that? Yeah, they said they're going to their girlfriends after what they did to me. And there was no protection th that has been used at that time. <sighs> yeah. Why do you think those three men decided to rape you? They raped me because uh, they want to change my sexuality as I am a lesbian woman. Actually, they used to say remarks, whatever they see me, saying to me, I'm not a man, I'm a woman, I, just, I have to have a man. Did you contract HIV from the attack from those men? I didn't contract the virus from the guys. I contracted it from the person who raped me after my husband decided to get someone to rape me, to contract me. Your husband paid someone yes. to come and rape you? Mm -hmm. He said he wanted to teach me a lesson, but he can still take me back. What lesson was he trying to teach you? To be a real woman, the first thing that he said. To understand myself as a woman, my duties as a woman. With my sexuality, that's what he was trying to say. What do you feel about the, the fact that you are trying to live life as a lesbian and this has happened to you? Does it not make you think twice? This is who I am. You know, people think that we are not normal. We need to be saved from what we don't know. But the South African constitution protects your rights. It protects the rights, but it doesn't go wherever we go. You are on your own. Where would you be safe? No way. In your own house, you're not safe. We are not safe. Here in South Africa, lesbians are sexually assaulted to try to modify their seemingly unnatural sexual orientation. It's what sociologists call corrective or curative rape. These assaults are taking place despite gays having protection under the law. In other parts of Africa, gays and lesbians are abused physically and verbally. And in over 30 African countries, there is no legislation to protect the rights of gays. We asked three homosexuals from different parts of the continent to tell us about their experience of coming out. I'm Joel Gustav Nana. I come from Cameroon. Article 347 of the Penal Code states that every person who has sex with a person of his sex shall be punished of six months to five years in jail. I am Kasha Jacqueline from Uganda. 
the law says that anyone who has carnal knowledge is seven years imprisonment, and anyone caught in the act, it's life imprisonment. There is too much harassment, both physical and verbal. I am Reverend Roland Jide Macaulay. I am the pastor of House of Rainbow Church in Lagos. Nigeria has a pending law called the Same-Sex Prohibition Bill. The Same-Sex Prohibition Bill also seeks to criminalize people that provide services, churches, clubs. I mean, my parents walking away from my home could be arrested for aiding and abetting, supporting and promoting same-sex amorous relationship. Now, Nigeria already have a law that actually prohibits carnal knowledge, which was an inheritance from colonialism. That law actually in the south punishable 7 to 14 years imprisonment and of course in the northern part of Nigeria under the Sharia law is turning to death. There are some places in Kampala which are gay friendly and they've been identified in the press. So people go there to attack the gays who are there. So people who are very homophobic. The atmosphere for homosexuals in Nigeria is very frightening. They carry on their daily life in great secrecy. Homophobia takes place in the family, at the workplace. Even landlords discriminate against their tenants if they find out that they're gay. A homosexual is believed to be a witchcraft practitioner, and even they treat homosexuals like a pervert. How does that make you feel? <sighs> Angry. Do you feel you're treated as if you were inhuman? Yes. You know, in Uganda, they think that when we advocate or demand for our rights as gay people, they think we want extraordinary rights. Yet we do not want that. We want something that was robbed from us, that belongs to us. The issue is that let's be like them, like the rest. We will just want to be like them. Homosexuals in certain African countries live in a state of constant fear, something we discovered last week in Jamaica. Hatred and hostility is widespread, and these sentiments cascade down from the very top. Zimbabwe's president, Robert Mugabe, once proclaimed that homosexuals were worse than pigs and dogs. Now, other African leaders may use less provocative language, but they argue that homosexual tendencies are unbiblical, unnatural, and essentially un-African. Do these assertions stand up to scrutiny? Mary Haynes is the director of the Gender Equity Unit at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. Homophobia is actually from global waste. The same-sex relationships in all kinds of forms have been throughout the centuries happening on the continent. What you're saying then is that homophobia is not African. It's not an African instinct. Homophobia, it's a very young concept and maybe people don't understand that phobia means a fear of and I don't think homosexuals if they actually exert a fear. If you'd understand it is heterosexuals doing the violence and the discrimination. People in same sex relationships should be fearful of heterosexuals, so I would is it heterophobia that exists. Why then do you think there are so many problems in African nations? What is the problem? I always go back to religion also. The whole thing of colonialism. So if you historically look at those concepts and see what really happened in communities, your marriage being sanctioned in a church, is it an African concept? If the issue around borders, around ethnicity, around all those kinds of things, actually foreign to the continent this area, the Western Cape, for instance, you will find many mission stations, you know, that came and established themselves and with them brought certain concepts around religion. It came with the Western concepts of legalizing uh, behavior that they thought it's unlawful, that they thought it's criminal. And this was then written in the statutes of, of these countries. And if you look at these countries, the, the legal framework is so very much based on the uh, mother colony. And for me, those things are not African. According to Mary Hames, it's homophobia, not homosexuality, that's un-African. She cites the huge influence of the church in shaping both the law and public opinion across the continent. In South Africa, some of the most liberal gay laws in the world exist, yet the church here is also struggling with the very concept of homosexuality. Keith Vermeulen represents the South African Council of Churches. 
They cannot accept them as they are. They have not come to the point of accepting the scientific and medical accounts that gays and lesbians are people who are born with their differences in the same way as heterosexuals are, but still believe that their theological pastoral work might be able to change homosexuals into heterosexuals. That, unfortunately, is one of the ways that fuels not only confusion within the life of of the community in South Africa, but within the religious communities as well. Does it also have the fact of paralyzing the debate as well because there are so many conflicting messages going out there? I think the debate not only is paralyzed, it's completely stifled in those denominations because there's no way these particular denominations see themselves as being able to compromise their theological thought and integrity on, the, on their social and medical interpretations of who a gay and what a gay and what a lesbian is over against their moral judgment. That presents the difficulty of the churches being the gatekeepers of social equity within this nation, which has this wonderful constitution. It's difficult. We are now seeing the political and the civil and the legal take a step forward and even to be outpacing the church's theological promotion of of equity, which in the Christian and Judaic tradition begins right in the beginning of the scriptures that all human beings were created equal in the image of God. In the course of making these two coming out programs for the BBC, we've seen how the law, society and religion determine how gays are treated. In Jamaica, we discovered there is little tolerance of gays and there's no prospect of any liberalisation of the laws concerning homosexuals. Violence against gays is also commonplace. In South Africa, it's the politicians who have changed the law, enshrining gay rights, and society is playing catch-up. Yet here, too, homosexuals continue to be abused. As the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights stands, there is no specific provision made for the protection of gays. It's an issue for all the world's nations to consider. For those who want gays to live openly, safely and with equal rights, the sooner the debate begins, the better. For those who don't accept homosexuality, there's no rush to examine the issue.